My name is Derek Davis and we're here today at the Francis Crick Institute in the centre of London and for many years I've run the flow cytometry facility here. My name is Rachel Walker, I'm the head of flow cytometry at Babram Institute in Cambridge. Right. I started in flow cytometry in the early 80s um, looking at DNA content in cells but not using flow cytometry, using a cytometric method to look at uh, DNA in cells and we could count maybe a hundred cells in an hour. I got in contact with somebody I knew who had a flow cytometer. Suddenly I found I could do the same amount of data in 10 minutes. Changed my life completely. I first started doing flow cytometry during my PhD. Um, I was tasked with running um, a quite complex cell sorter. Um, so I was um, trying to separate out stem cells from blood um, using this cell sorter. Through doing that I met a lot of people in flow cytometry and realized that there was actually quite a nice career in it. So I moved after my PhD to Cambridge where I worked in a core facility and I quickly moved from there to running a small core at the university for five years and then I moved to Babram Institute in 2012 to be head of flow cytometry where I had a team of six people. I um, ended up getting an MRC grant to look at the role of flow cytometry in cervical screening and from there I ended up thinking this is a great technique, this is a technique that has multiple applications. So I moved to what was the Imperial Cancer Research Fund in the core facility there. Well, flow cytometry is really just a complex form of fluorescence microscopy. We make fluorescence measurements on cells. What makes a flow cytometer a flow cytometer is we do that measurement in suspension, which means that we can look at vast numbers of cells very, very quickly. And we can label anything in a cell with a fluorescent marker. So it can be a, a protein that's expressed on the surface or inside the cell, where we use a fluorescently labelled antibody. It can be DNA, it can be RNA or it could be a functional aspect of the cell, something like calcium flux or, or pH. And flow cytometry gets used in all sorts of different areas. So it gets used in research, such as immunology research. Um, it also gets used in the clinical lab for the diagnosis of diseases such as cancer. It gets used in pharma for screening of drugs. But actually, it's te the technology is used for lots of things you don't even think about. For example, in beer and wine making, a lot of flow cytometry is used to look at um, bacteria and yeast. So the step-by-step -step guide to running a sample on a flow cytometer is once we come to the cytometer, it's a fluidics-based machine. So we have to ensure that we have sufficient sheath fluid in our machine to be able to run our experiments. So the first thing we'll check is that our sheath fluid box here is full and our waste box is empty. Once we're happy with that, we can check within the cytometer that the optical filters are in the correct place. So by lifting the lid, we can see the lasers in the cytometer and we can see the optical filters that allow us to select wavelengths of light that are specific for the fluorochromes that we're going to be using. At that point, we can start up the program that runs the cytometer. We would always run through a quality control check, to make sure that the machine is working correctly. And the way we do that is to run multi-peak beads. So we put our bead solution in a tube onto the sample injection probe that is then pressurized which forces that solution through our laser beams as our cells or beads in this case pass through the laser beams we get fluorescence emitted we then collect that fluorescence with the optical filters that we've just seen and then we capture that information quantitate it and display it on our computer screen so Derek showed you how uh, a flow cytometer works and there are companies that have made image cytometers which marry together the way that flow cytometer works with imaging so it allows us to see where in our cells um, our staining is. And so the um, image stream cytometer uses laser beams the same way that we do in a conventional flow cytometer and our cells are aligned in a flow cell and then they're using microscopy objectives to be able to um, zoom in on bits of the cells and then our fluorescence is detected using CCD chips. After scientists have run their experiment through a flow cytometer, they usually use a post acquisition software to be able to look at the different populations uh, that they've acquired. So here are some plots in the Flojo post acquisition software. We are looking in the first plot at lymphocytes. These are a population of white blood cells. And what we want to know from this experiment is what percentage of cells are CD4 positive and which percentage of cells are CD8 positive. So in the next plot, we are looking at CD3 positives because our lymphocytes should be CD3 positive. 
and then we're gating then onto our CD4 and CD8 population. So our CD8 has been stained with a dye that's been excited by the red laser, which is called APC, and that's on the x-axis, and on the y-axis our CD4 stain has been um, is FITSI, which is excited by a blue laser. And we can see in this plot we've got four different populations, a very small negative population, and then two larger single positive populations showing our percentage of CD4 and CD8 cells, and a very, very small population of double positive cells. The most common technical challenge we face in flow cytometry is preparing a single cell suspension. Okay, we are a single cell technology, so we need to get our cells as monodisperse as possible. Sometimes that's very easy, we're dealing with blood for example. Sometimes it's much more challenging if we're dealing with solid tumours for example. Practice always makes perfect, but it's the, the preparation that is key to a good flow cytometry experiment. We can overcome this challenge by, of course, using the core facility who have expertise in sample preparation, panel design and indeed running and analysing your flow cytometry experiment. My top five tips for using a cytometer is to know the cytometer that you're using, be aware of the lasers and the filters that are in there. For example, if you're looking at a red fluorescent protein, you'll want to make sure you've got the correct laser to be able to excite that, that fluorochrome. Second tip would be to know your fluorochromes. Not all fluorochromes are equal. They're not all equal in their brightness. They're not all equal in they, the way they react to, say, fixation. Thirdly, sample preparation. Sample preparation, very, very important. If you're running cells that are unfixed, you want to ensure that you've had high viability to ensure that you're looking at healthy cells and what those healthy cells are doing. Fourthly, make sure that the cytometer is fit for purpose, that it's being QC'd and maintained correctly. QCing of a, of a cytometer is very important to ensure that you are using the machine to the best of its ability and there's no point in doing all the hard work of good sample prep and, and designing your experiment if you're going to run it on a poorly maintained cytometer. And finally, make sure you make use of the knowledge and expertise of the people in the core facility. Flow cytometry is uh, going to head in maybe slightly different directions in the future. At the moment we're slightly limited with the number of fluorochromes we can measure on an individual cell. So there's more of a move in the field to increase that. Much of that has to be done in the, in the chemistry lab and the development of, of new fluorochromes. But the more fluorochromes we can measure on a cell, the more precisely we can identify it. As with every time you buy a mobile phone, you're getting more, uh, more for your money. With our cytometers, we're finding that these cytometers are becoming um, simpler and easier for people to use and more affordable. But also, we're finding that there's more lasers and more detectors and better electronics to enable people to do better um, experiments as well. So I've recently changed my role here at the Crick and I'm looking after training for our science technology platforms or core facilities. The idea being that we have a lot of expertise here at the Crick in core facility technology. So as well as training our users and our staff here at the Crick, we also want to be able to help support science in the UK by training in particular technologies. So we're able to put on courses on almost any technological subject and if you have a specific need, please contact me.